Amen. Good to be in God's house this morning. Let me hear you say amen. amen. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, if you would, please. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Uh, it's been a while uh, since I have uh, been preaching uh, this series of messages. And uh, so I'm just going to kind of run back through them very, very quickly uh, and, and follow through with where we left off the last time. Um, Solomon, the Bible tells us and, and history tells us, was the wisest man to ever live. Uh, there was no king other than King Jesus greater than him. There was no king wiser than him. My microphone on. There we go. No king wiser than him. And uh, truly this is exhibited in what you see in the first few uh, verses of the book of Ecclesiastes. No one, no one on the earth at the time of Solomon, and Solomon lived roughly a thousand years uh, before Christ, and so that's about 3,000 years ago. No one knew at that time what happened with all the water. When all the water came down from the heavens, and it went into the uh, creeks and went into the little streams. And the streams went into the rivers. And the rivers ran into the sea. But then more water comes down from the heavens and the sea doesn't get full. And no one at that time knew how that, how that even was or, or, or how, that, how that happened. That the seas never, never rose from their level, never got uh, larger than they did. Uh, it wasn't until thousands of years later, I guess, I'm not sure exactly who, who it was that officially discovered what's called the water cycle. But Solomon wrote about it 3,000 years ago, I guess by inspiration of God himself. If you look in verse 4 of chapter 1, the Bible says, One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth. And the sun goeth down and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. Now everything that Solomon is saying uh, teaches us in one aspect of life or another that everything goes in a cycle. Everything goes uh, sort of like, more or less in a circle. There is the, what we call the circle of life. Uh, old folks die off. Young, young, young people are born into this world to take their place. Once those young people go to a certain age, they give birth. They bring in children. They get to an age at which they die. They die off. The children that were born unto them take their place. And that's what he meant here in verse 4. One generation passeth away and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. Then he says in verse 7, and this is where we're going to get our wisdom this morning. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. And then he says this, unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Now, again, this is common knowledge to us. Uh, who live nowadays, we understand that, especially where we live here uh, in, in Missouri. Uh, in fact, that hurricane, Hurricane Barrel, that came up from the Gulf of Mexico, all of that water in the Gulf of Mexico came down from the Mississippi River and was dumped into the Gulf of Mexico. Hurricane Barrel comes through and picks up all of that moisture from the wind, from the sun, from the heat and so on, picks up all that water from the ocean and starts bringing it over land. And so that you saw that hurricane, it went up into Texas and it came up and around through uh, Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, Missouri. We got a day, a day and a night just full, nonstop rain, just rained and rained and rained. And then that thing kept on going. Well, all of that rain now that we got has run into, in this area, it's run into uh, the Merrimack River. It's run into, uh, what is this, Platten Creek over here. Uh, the, uh, it's run into the Big River. It's run into, um, oh, what am I trying to think of? Joe, yeah, Joe Ackham. 
I, they are called Joachim Creek or Joachim River. Which one is it? Yeah, whatever. Anyway, it all runs into the Mississippi. Mississippi is going to take it down to the Gulf of Mexico. What's going to happen is that moisture is going to get brought back up again and come back around right over the top of St. Louis, drop its rain, and it's going to start. It's going to do that all over again. And I was pondering this one time, and I was pondering my life and how uh, sometimes I felt like that I was just really on fire for God, that I, it's like I couldn't fail, like I, I just could do no wrong. And I would, I would think to myself, Mike, you finally got there. You finally got to the place where you're not going to make any more mistakes. You finally got to the place, Mike, where you're not going to sin anymore. I was wrong. I was dead wrong. And so time came around again. And I found myself down on my face before the Lord. Crying. Because I had failed God. I said some things. I did some things. I saw some things. I heard some things. I failed God. And I said, God, I, I don't understand this. I thought that I was over all that. And God laid it on my heart, this passage here. And I read it, and I got understanding. If you Turn to uh, Psalm chapter 1, if you would. Psalm chapter 1. This is uh, a, a reminder to those who've heard this already. And um, just a way of introducing where I'm going with all of this this morning. Psalm chapter 1, one of my favorite psalms. That in Psalm 32. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, I, I like to read God's word. I like to think about God's word. I like to meditate on God's word. I don't do it all the time. Some days I do it. Man, I can't get enough of it. I just read and read and read. And boy, God just fill my mind and my heart. And I'll be making notes and just enjoy it. And then I'm like everybody else. There are days where it starts getting late in the afternoon. And God's reminding me, Mike, you've been so busy about the ministry you forgot the most important part of the ministry, and that is laboring in the Word. And God has to literally make me read the Bible. And so, I can't say that this blessing belongs to me, but I can tell you who, who it does belong to. Jesus Christ. If we are in Jesus Christ, then we also will be recipients of these blessings. If you're not in Christ, you don't get them. It's as simple as that. So uh, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now verse 3 is where we're going. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit, and there it is, in his season. There is no such thing in the state of Missouri of a tree that constantly daily brings forth new fruit there is no such thing that i'm aware of of a tree in this in this area that just constantly every day brings forth fruit i'm sure that if there was eckerts would own every one of them <laughs> amen and they'd be selling you a ticket to go and pick them every month i like going to eckerts by the way peach season Whew. i got sick Eating so many peaches. But take a look at this tree. Let's remind ourselves again of what these rings mean. These rings represent the age of that tree. We can see uh, by way of counting the rings, just, just a glance at it, the tree is not very old. It's a relatively young tree. We can also tell by these rings the years that there was plenty of rain. And the years that there wasn't much rain. 
We can tell that by looking at the ring. We, can, we know then that every year that went by, this tree got a little bit taller and a little bit stronger every year. Because every one of these rings represents strength to this tree. This tree may have, may have been uh, uh, easy to blow over the first two or three years. But by the time it gets to this age and starts getting older, then there isn't much in the world that can push this tree down. There just isn't much at all that can do it. And that's how it is in the Christian walk and the Christian life that you and I are attempting to live. I have found that the longer I live this life, the more that I grow in Christ, the more that I learn from the Bible, the more that I take in from the nourishment of God, from the trees need sunlight, amen? The more of the sun that I get, who's the sun? It's Jesus Christ. The more of the sun that I get, the more of the, the blessing of the water that comes up from the roots, it comes up from the ground, the more of those things that I get, the stronger that I'm eventually going to be. And things, things that could have easily taken me out years ago, they don't work as well anymore as they used to. You follow me, somebody say amen. You are getting stronger. Things are getting better in your life. And that's why I guess when we get to a certain age, we just become grumpy old Christians. Amen. And by that time, ain't nobody going to convince us of anything else. Why bother? Amen. But I'll, I'll tell you this. I think the devil knows that. And for the most part, he'll leave them old folks alone. That's why he goes after those kids. And it's those young saplings that we need to be watching out for. And protecting them. Amen. Now, so we have the cycles of life there given to us in the, in the sea and in the rivers and so on and so on. Now, I want us to go to, uh, turn to, turn to Genesis chapter 1 if you would. You're going to see the cycles in the creation week. In fact, this is God now. Uh, Number one, this is going to have two applications. The first application is, this is someone who is not a born-again Christian, but God is going to save them. He is going to make them a new, and, and this word creature doesn't mean like an animal or a, a mouse or something, anything like that, a squirrel or anything. A creature means a created being. So this is, number one, how God makes a new creature out of us. Number two, to those of you who are born again, you're going to see in this how God is, this is what David prayed for. When David sinned against Uriah the Hittite and Bathsheba by committing adultery with her and when Nathan the prophet confronted David concerning his sin, David sat down in his prayer and wrote out his song to God. And it's Psalm 51. And this is where David says, Create in me a clean heart and renew. What does that word mean? Renew in me a right spirit. So David even recognizes that he blew it, that he sinned, he confessed his sin, and God forgave him of his sin. And now he's saying, God created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. You see the language that David is using there? He's talking about the cycles that he's going in. And all of this applies 
both to those who are not saved, who are going to be saved, and to those who are saved, who, as everything in life does, it brings to us new things, but then those new things turn into old things, and those old things are corrupt, they rot, they're no good, and we need new blessings given to our lives again. So on day one of creation, let's read, the, in fact, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, your blessing now upon your word. And Lord, Father, just open up our ears and our hearts that we receive it, Lord. Bless, bless this word, we pray in Jesus' name, and amen. So on day one of creation, here's what God does. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So this is you now. God creates a brand new saint. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So here's what's happening. God has taken someone now, they're dead in trespasses and sins, they are, they are dead to, uh, to God, they're, it's just like there's nothing in their life whatsoever. There's no joy, there's no happiness. Uh, any, any kind of joy or happiness they exhibit is fake. And it doesn't last either. They do not know that they can have joy that will last them and last them and last them and will carry them through the darkest of days. They do not know that they can have a joy on the inside of them even while on the outside there's no visible joy on the inside, they're still glad that they're saved. They're still glad that they're going to heaven. Somebody say amen. So God begins a work in them. Now they are without form and they are void. And the Bible says that they are void of understanding. God is doing a work in them, but they don't understand it yet. Something happens in their life. Let's say that somebody that they're close to dies. And all of a sudden now, they're confronted with the reality of death. They go to the funeral. They're looking at their loved one in that casket. They're bawling their eyes out when, when they said they would not cry. They're crying their eyes out and a realization hits them. That person in that casket they knew that person. And while everybody's lining up, going by the casket, saying, oh, they're in a better place, they're in a better place, they're in a, you, know how, you know how people are at a funeral, everybody that dies is going to heaven. And yet, now you're looking at it for the first time and, and you're going, I knew them. It would surprise me if they were in heaven. Now they don't they don't have all the they don't have any answers whatsoever. But just they're slapped in the face with the reality that death brings God's judgment. And if you know that person that's in that casket and you know him well, you know for a fact that they will never ever pass muster. They'll never make it into God's kingdom because of the kind of person that they really were. Because you worked with them and you know how they really lived. And you're going, they're not right with God. And I guess that means that if they're not right with God, I did the same things they did. If they're not right with God, I'm not right with God. But now, for the first time in their life, something happens. Look at verse 3. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light that it was good. So what happened was, God turned the light on in their life. And for the first time, they see themselves the way that they really are. Not the way that they've told themselves, not the way that they've told other people, maybe they've, maybe you've, you or somebody or whoever we're talking about here, maybe you've had someone witness to you. Someone gave you Bible verses, John 3.16. And you kind of know what John 3.16 says. And you know that 
the things that you see in your life right now are the true ways that are really are that it's the way that God actually sees you and you know that you're not right with God because God said let there be light in the case of someone who is already a Christian this applies to you because now there's something in your life that God's going to deal with you know it'd be great that on the day that we get saved it would be awesome if God would just take every sin issue, every disobedience, every rebellion thing out of completely out of our life. And from that day forward, we live this perfect Christian life without sin, without defilement, without mistakes, without uh, going against God. It would be great if that would come to us, but doesn't. And don't let anybody fool you. Because there's some people that believe that, that it does. It's in their doctrine. They believe it. Church of Christ believes that. Some of the, uh, some of the uh, so-called charismatic churches, they believe that. That you can get this instant sanctification and you will never sin again in the, any day in your life ever. But that's a lie. And it's a setup. It's, it it would be like if I said, today and today only, we're running a special on salvation. If you come forward this morning and ask Jesus into your heart, God will deposit $100 million U.S. into your bank account. You will live high on the hog for the rest of your life. So I have an altar call and everybody comes down. Everybody wants in on that. Well, a week goes by and they keep checking the account. There's no money. Two weeks go by. They keep checking the account. There's no money. Third week goes by. She keep checking the account. There's no money. And now they're starting to ask questions. So they start coming to me. He said, uh, Pastor, you said that if, that if we did this and, and we, did, we acted in true faith, that we would get $100 million in our account. And I would say, you mean you don't have it? Well, obviously, you're not acting in true faith. In other words, it's your fault, not mine. Believe it or not, that sort of is. I'm exaggerating in some cases, but technically i have known people who have come out of the charismatic movement who have told me that's how it works they fill people's minds with all these promises that they're going to be healthy they're going to be wealthy then they're not ever going to be sick and if they get sick and the, and it, the sickness doesn't go away they go to their pastor and say pastor what's what's going on i i don't understand i'm not healthy i'm not I'm, in fact i'm dying the pastor can only tell them it's your fault you just don't have enough faith to do it. And you know what that is? That is the devil. He has set you up to fall. Because you're going to walk out of that meeting and you're going to say, I will never, ever, ever listen to another preacher as long as I live. That's how it is. But God's going to turn the light on for you and he's going to deal with an issue in your life. Now he's already dealt with things the last time the cycle went around. And God says, okay, we got, we got that one taken care of. Now we're going to deal with this in your life. And the process starts all over again. God's going to deal with this next issue that comes along in your life. And trust me, I don't care how long you live. There's always going to be plenty of issues with you. Amen. There's all kinds of junk you're guilty of. So... Don't worry, you're never going to run out, all right? So that's day one, God turning the light on and you seeing it now for the first time. Now, here's day two. Uh, turn to um, you know, Genesis chapter one, and then I want you to turn to Isaiah 55. Yeah, Isaiah 55. Open your Bibles, that way you know exactly that what I'm got up on the screen is the word of God 
I'm not lying to you. I'm not, and you can, and here, here's another thing I want you to do. The reason why I like for you to open your Bibles up. That way you know that I'm not handling the Word of God deceitfully. You can look at the context of what I just read to you, and then you can know then that I'm not trying to mislead you by extracting scriptures that are out of context with what else is said in the Bible. So, Genesis chapter 1. This is day 2 now. Here's, here's the next cycle that God's going to take this lost person in. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. So what does he mean by that? So God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Now that seems to be pretty simple. God only did one thing here. Is that he took all the waters. And, and we can see this uh, in, from our vantage point. In fact, if you go out today... It's cloudy, it's overcast, there was a little bit of shower this morning, a little bit of sprinkle rain. And you go out and you look outside and you look up into the firmament, the first heaven, which is the sky above us. And you can clearly see that God has divided the water that is on this earth from the water that's up above us. There is a division of the waters. Then... If you go beyond that from the first heaven to the second heaven, which we really can't see that. We have to just kind of apply that by faith. I believe that separating the end of the universe between the end of the universe, wherever that is, and the third heaven where God himself dwells. I believe that there is a body of water there of some kind. And I think that's what is represented in like when the Israelites went through the Red Sea to go to the other side. It was water that was separating them from the mountain of God. And so they had to go through that. When they go into the promised land... There they are again. They're on the east side of the River Jordan. They have to go through the River Jordan. And God does again what he did with the Red Sea. The men carrying the Ark of the Covenant set their foot down on the banks of the Jordan River. The Jordan River stopped and built the water up in heaps, the Bible says. And the river dried up and the people walked across Jordan River on the dry ground. There's a memorial there somewhere. Because God, or Joshua had all the leaders of the 12 tribes take a huge stone from off the, uh, the bank of the river and set it down in the midst of the river to make like a, uh, like a pillar there. And they stacked up 12 stones there in the midst of the river Jordan. Then Joshua took 12 stones out of the river Jordan and put it up on the banks of the river Jordan. And when anybody said, why did, why did we do that? It was so that the fathers could tell their children, this is the memorial that we had placed there to prove that this is where we walked across on dry ground, where God separated the waters. We walked across on dry ground. Uh, my great, great, great granddaddy was one of the men that pulled a rock out of the midst of the Jordan River, put it up on the bank. He saw Joshua take uh, a stone, 12 stones from the banks of the river and put it down in the river Jordan. It's proof that God separated the waters from the waters. Amen. Now, here's where I'm going with this. God separated the water's up here, and up here he calls it heaven. Down here, what we're all standing on is earth. And God is showing us on this day that there is a difference between heaven and earth. 
Now I'm going to show you that. You turn to Isaiah 55, did you not? Look at verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. By the way, if you're hearing my voice right now, and you don't know 100% whether you're saved or not, I would be finding out today. More than one person has driven away from a church service having not yielded their life over to God and been killed before they ever made it home. Since you don't know what God's going to do in the next three seconds, much less the next three hours, if you don't know whether or not you are truly born again, I would suggest to you that before you leave this place, you should find out. And you say, well, how do I find out? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's fairly simple. It really is. But here's, here's what God said. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. I like it when God abundantly pardons. Amen. That's more than just God forgiving one thing that I did. God's going to forgive all of the things that I did. Amen. Now in verse 8, take a look at this. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. And here it is now. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. What is God telling us here? Number one, he's telling us we are not God. We are never going to be God. Amen. So quit thinking that you're God or quit thinking that you are smarter than God. Quit thinking that you can fix your own problems. You thinking that you can fix your own problems is like me thinking I can fix my own car. Why is that so funny? Why is that so funny? I did not inherit my dad's automotive repair gene. I changed the uh, spark plugs on my minivan one time. Twice I had to go looking for the wrench that I threw. I don't like working on cars. So I don't do it. I let somebody who's way smarter than me, which doesn't take much, I let them do it. But God says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how high my thoughts are above your thoughts. In other words, we don't know yet. We've got this web James Webb Telescope that now is looking farther than we have ever, ever looked before in space. The things that they're seeing with this telescope are baffling those who have held to the Big Bang Theory because the Big Bang Theory is falling apart because they're seeing galaxies 
that are formed that are actually older than they think the universe is. Now, how is that possible? That they find stars and galaxy clusters that are older than they think the universe is. How can that be? It can't be. They've got to be wrong. Amen? So, we haven't found the oldest galaxy yet. At some point, we may invent a telescope that sees farther than the Webb telescope. And it, then we're going to be able to see things that are so outrageously far away that science is going to have to come up with some whole new... They might have to start believing the Bible. Amen? And so, however high the very end of the universe is, then there is God who is the most high God. Nothing is higher than Him. That's how much smarter God is than you are. And see, here's, here's, here's the problem with someone who is lost and even somebody who says they're saved. The, the problem is that we might say, amen, yes, we're not, we're not higher than God. But the truth of it is, we live in such a way as that we think that we are smarter than God. In Psalm 139, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Uh, thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, Thou knowest it all together. You know what David is saying here? There's, David is saying that there's not a word that you can say that God doesn't already know you're going to say it. There isn't a thought that you can attain to that God didn't, doesn't already know that you are going to think it. There is nothing, no idea that you come up with where God says, Whoa! That's a pretty good idea. Why didn't I think of that? That has never happened and it's never going to. Verse 5, Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Look at this. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Why did Jonah think that he could hide from God? Why did he think that? He must not have really known that much about God, or he would have said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't hide from God. No matter where I go, God is going to be there. He's going to find me. I can't hide from him. I can't run from him. But apparently, he thought that he could, and he tried it. And you know what he said in Jonah chapter 2? He referred to himself as being in the belly of hell itself. And he said, here's God here too. There is no place that I can go that I'm gone away from the presence of an almighty, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful God. So to a lost person, God has introduced himself to you as the one who is not fooled by your rhetoric. In other words, when you say, Oh, I believe that God will take my good deeds and weigh them against my bad deeds and I think I'll come out all right. Listen, God's not fooled by you. God knows all the good deeds that you did, but God also knows all the bad deeds that you did too. And I'm here to tell you that according to the word of God, you cannot fool God. You cannot cheat God. And you cannot make God believe how good you really are because God knows the truth about you. 
God knows things about you that you, you don't let your wife know. God knows things about you you don't let your husband know. God knows things about you that you don't, you don't let your mom and dad know about you. God knows it all. And you are never, ever, ever going to be God. Turn to Isaiah chapter 14. I'm going to introduce you to somebody who thinks they can be like God. Isaiah 14 verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials... The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Verse 12, now, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. By the way, the Bible that says, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, that's the wrong Bible. Christ is the morning star. Lucifer is the right translation. Just ask any Satan worshiper. Ask them, who is Lucifer? They'll say, that's our God. The devil. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Now, I'm going to do this. I want you to just, I don't know, just put on your imagination cap just for a minute. And imagine you thinking these thoughts here. And I'll say this. Remember what the devil promised Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods. So I believe that not only does this apply to Satan, Lucifer himself, the dragon, the serpent, so on. But this also is to all of the people who think so highly of themselves that they think that they can be smarter than God. They, in fact, they say to themselves and they say to everybody, there is no God. I don't believe in God. And so I think people who believe in God are idiotic. I think they're stupid. I think they're uh, intolerant. And I, now I'm a tolerant person, but I don't tolerate Christians. You're intolerant of... Anyway. But the people who think so highly of themselves in their own intellect that they think that they are smarter than God. So let's read this. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which is weak in the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, or the north side is what it means. And the north is always an indicator of the highest heaven. In Ezekiel chapter 1, when, he, when Ezekiel is seeing the chariot of God coming down from heaven, he's seeing it come down from the north. So I think it represents the height of heaven. And he says, uh, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. 
I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. In other words, there, your God doesn't fool me. I'm not fooled by your mythology and your fairy tales about your sky wizard. I've heard, of, I've heard that name applied to God. About your sky wizard, about your God who you think created everything and who you think is above all people. I actually, in my intellect, I'm actually above your God. And so I don't fear any man's God. I don't fear any man's religion. I'm above that. I am beyond that. And so I am smarter than your God. And in that sense, you also are Lucifer. Because you believe that you can achieve Godhood. Who remembers John Denver? Or I should, I should say, who remembers John Dutchendorf? That was his real name. And it wouldn't fit on the album. John Dutchendorf, they ran out of space. Dutchendorf. No. He named himself after Denver. His dad was a uh, pilot in the Air Force. John Dutchendorf did an, uh, an interview with uh, Life magazine back when he first became famous. They called, it the, they called him the Sunshine Boy. And at the time, John Denver was going to... Um, he was following a German New Age teacher... Um, trying to think of his name here. Hang on a second. Werner Erhard was his name. And Erhard had convinced Denver that if he went through all the practices, did all the meditations, uh, accomplished all of these high thoughts in his mind, and Denver actually said this in the interview. It was printed in Life magazine. John Denver said, I believe I will be a God one of these days. How did he die? He was, a, he was an alcoholic. And they had pulled his pilot's license several times. Because he was always drinking. He was in an experimental airplane. And something went wrong. There's different sides of the story. But the bottom line is he crashed into the ocean. See, he wanted to be high above everybody else. That's why he liked to fly. And the song Rocky Mountain High literally is about him. And you know the lyrics of that song is, you might say he was born again. That was John Denver. He had had this rapturous experience up on the mountains. And he actually felt that he had attained the status of God. But apparently God died in the ocean. Turn to... Ezekiel 28. By the way, I, I, those, of you, those of you who are born again, I want you to listen now to these words because I've done this and I know you've done it. I have thought that I was smarter or as smart as God. I have had times where I thought that my way was the only right way. I actually, I've told this story before. I woke up one morning, and I'm not kidding you, the Holy Ghost was sitting there on the side of the bed. And no sooner than I opened my eyes, 
I heard in my, in my heart, Mike, do you trust me? Before I could lie and say, God, of course I trust you. The Holy Ghost said, you don't. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. It was a situation where I thought that what I was doing was the only way to get God to be in favor of me and my wife and do what it was that we wanted done. And I was going to lie to God and say, God, of course I trust you. I'm Mike Hoggard. Everybody knows that Mike Hoggard trusts God. And God said, don't say it, Mike. Don't lie to me. You think that your way is the only way that this can come about. I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter how it all ends up or whatever. I can still do what I promised you I was going to do. And I don't need your help. Whew. That hit me. I mean, here I am trying to wake myself up in the morning. And God hits me with that one. I should have just stayed in bed all day long. Whew. But God was right. I can think too highly of myself and I can think that I can do things as good or better than God or that my plan is better than God's plan. Now, I'm not what some people refer to as a control freak. But I bet you there are control freaks sitting here in this room this morning. I bet you there are. Okay? In other words, you've got to have your hand in everything and it all has to go your way or you think it's all going to fall apart. Everybody, nobody else is as smart as you. Nobody else is as good as you. And you've got to do everything and it's all got to be done the way you want it. Including... God, including God. So Ezekiel 28, here it is again. The word of the Lord came again unto me saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up. Listen to that. Underline that. Because your heart is lifted up. You've magnified your heart above God. Um, because thine heart is lifted up and thou hast said, I am a God, capital G, by the way. I sit in the seat of God, capital G, again, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So watch it now. Man down here. God up here. Of the two, who is best qualified to manage your life? God is. But we like to think that our way counts too. God, you need my help, don't you? God, let's do it this way. And then, then I will be satisfied. Then I'll feel better. Then I'll know that because I had my hand in it, I know then it'll work out better and I will feel better. And if God wants anything out of your life, God wants you to sit down, be quiet, and watch Him work. Amen. Of the two, God and man, which one is going to get the eternal praise and thanksgiving? God is. And God said, I'm a jealous God. 
There's not room for anybody else on the throne of your life. It's me and me alone. Amen. And what did the devil say in Isaiah 14? I'll sit also in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I'm going to sit in God's throne. Look at right here. Because thine heart is lifted up, thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God on his throne in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Daniel, there's no secret that they can hide from thee with thy wisdom and with thy understanding. Thou hast gotten thee riches and gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. We even, we even think that our work skills are our own doing. Who gave you the ability to do what it is that you do good? God did that. God gave your hands skills. Your mind skills. God did that. Verse 6, Therefore thou saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, and behold, there, there, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords um, against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And here we are again. Back in Isaiah 14, Lucifer saying, I, I'm, I'm going to be like the Most High. And God says, yet you're going to be brought down to the sides of the pit. And here it is, he says it again in Ezekiel 28, where the prince of Tyrus, you could say it's Satan again, I believe it is. He says he's going to be uh, sitting in God's chair, ruling over God's creation, doing only what God can do. He thinks he can do it. He thinks because he's wiser than Daniel. He thinks he knows everything. And yet God's going to bring him down again to the pit. And the terrible of the nations are going to rule over him. He's going to die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. You're not God. 2 Thessalonians 2. I read that in Sunday school. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he, as God, sitteth in the... Here he is sitting again. In the driver's seat. In the seat of God. Showing himself that he is God. Remember, uh, verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. I'll say this to you. We're even creating right now in this world an artificial intelligence system that man will attempt to give it the ability to be smarter than God himself. Already, artificial intelligence has touched every aspect of our lives. If you think that artificial intelligence has not made a difference in your life, yet you are wrong. We are creating an image of the beast that will both speak 
and cause all who, who do not worship the image of the beast that they should be killed. That's what we're doing right now. We're creating from man's own wicked heart. We're creating artificial intelligence to be like man. But there's a problem with man. Man thinks that he can out God, God. But he can't. But it's man's attempt at becoming smarter than God. Seeing farther into the future than God. Knowing more than God. And God's not going to let anybody get away with it. So in, in this moment, on day two of creation, what God has done is he's exposed to you the lie. That you can be equal with God or that you can be smarter than God or that you can do things better than God. And this is really at the, the, the heart of whether a person will, will actually follow through and accept Christ as their Savior when, when they decide for themselves that they actually cannot do what God can do. And that they cannot save themselves. And let me tell you this. Every false gospel that there is, there is always a work that's attached to it whereby somebody says, if you do this, then you will be saved. And so the people then do that and they now have been told that they had a part in their own salvation. It's almost like they could do something that God could do. But God's telling them to do it. Like water baptism. If you are water baptized, then you can be saved. But that's not salvation, is it? But we're t they're the denominations that believe that are telling people that if they do this ritual, if they perform this deed, if they do this act, then they will be part of their own salvation. It's like they're putting them up equal with God. So God says, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. What's the truth? The truth is, you're not God. The truth is, no matter what you do, you cannot save yourself. And then to those of you who are already saved, the truth is, what God wants to do in your life, you're trying to take that from Him and try to do it yourself, and you can't do it. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Let me ask you to bow your head this morning. And just in the quiet of the moment... If an issue has arisen in your life and you're now seeing it because God said let there be light and you're seeing that you're actually taking away something that God wants to do in your life or something that God wants to do in somebody you love in their life. You think that you can do it on your own. You think you don't need God. You think you can maybe even do it better than God. I don't know. But you've set your heart as if it were the heart of God. I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning, if you want, to come down to one of these benches. Have a time of prayer. And repent of the sin of thinking that you're God. 
repent of the sin of trying to outdo God or trying to do something that God did. You know, the, the woman who had the issue of blood, she went to doctors and for 12 years she relied on those doctors to heal her. And none of it worked. And finally, when she had spent everything she had, she now believes that Jesus is the only one who could heal her. And did Jesus get mad at her? No. He healed her anyway. And like I said, Lisa and I have been through a situation where we thought that our way of doing things was the best way. We wanted control over it because we thought it would make us feel better if we did it. And we were wrong. And so, this morning, if you've got something in your mind or your heart, you don't know what to do about it, I would say give it to God because His ways are higher than your ways and His thoughts are higher than your thoughts.